Hi everyone, it's Syrian Girl. Things have been heating up in Syria between the US and Russia, and we are getting ever closer to World War III. There have been several UN Security Council meetings, and all have resulted in no agreement between the world powers. Russia's UN envoy Cherkin has stated that peace is almost impossible now. The US and Russia had agreed to a ceasefire in Syria. It was supposed to last for seven days and then be renewed. But on the seventh day, US warplanes attacked a Syrian airbase in Deir Zur, killing 80 Syrian soldiers and wounding 100. Those troops had fought back against a two-year siege by ISIS. The attack by the US Air Force came at the same time of an ISIS ground offensive, which resulted in ISIS taking over a strategic hilltop above the airbase. The attack on the Syrian army was definitely no accident. It lasted 50 minutes and involved several aircrafts. Syrian intelligence even said they possessed audio conversations between US commanders coordinating with ISIS on the ground. Why would they do this? Well, the US administration wants the Syrian airbase to fall to ISIS. They've been waiting for it to happen for two years and thought they'd give things a little nudge forward. The airbase is located in northeast Syria, near the same region that the State Department wants to balkanize into a Kurdish state. A few days prior to the write-up of the agreement, Kurdish militants had attacked the Syrian army in al hasaka and the Syrian Air Force was used to quell them. The Syrian Air Force is in the way of the US administration's objectives. Syria's airbases have always been a target in this war, one of the repeated mantras coming from the State Department is the need for no-fly zones and grounding Syria's air force. Here's an audio clip from the Armed Services Committee hearing that occurred a few days ago. What about the option of controlling the airspace so that barrel bombs cannot be dropped? All, all the options. Uh, they, what do you think of that option, sir? Uh, right now, Senator, for us to control all of the airspace in Syria would require us to go to war against Syria and Russia. That's a pretty fundamental decision that certainly I'm not going to make. So why is the U.S. prepared to start World War III over grounding Syria's air force? They want us to believe it's about protecting civilians, which is ridiculous since the U.S. government has been killing civilians with its own air force both inside Syria and throughout the Middle East. The U.S. government has openly said their goals in Syria are regime change and balkanization. And they are determined to do it, even if it means arming Islamic extremists like Al-Qaeda in Syria. But after five years of war, the Syrian army has successfully surrounded the Al-Qaeda-controlled side of Aleppo city, seen here in blue, preventing weapons and fighters from entering. The U.S.-backed insurgency was on the brink of defeat, and that's why the U.S. called for a ceasefire. At first, the U.S. administration kept the details of the ceasefire secret, probably because it had a lot to do with the U.S.'s relationship with Al-Qaeda. I'll let Kerry tell you himself. And for too long, some elements of the opposition have relied on an unholy alliance with al-Nusra and al-Nusra is al-Qaeda. It was also very importantly part of the plan that when those efforts of cooperation commenced, Syrian warplanes would be prohibited from flying over areas where the legitimate opposition and al-Nusra were present, where the legitimate opposition and al-Nusra were present, in order to give us the opportunity to work at the separation. Basically, Kerry wants time to distinguish moderates from Al-Qaeda. You know, those nice moderates, the ones that eat hearts of dead soldiers and behead children. Why would they want to separate them? Because it's hard to make the argument that you shouldn't bomb Al-Qaeda. And when Assad has the right to determine who he's going to bomb, because he can quote go after Nusra, but go after the opposition at the same time because he wants to. No, Kerry, you said yourself it's because they fight alongside each other. The ceasefire agreement was as follows. 
Eight trucks would be allowed into the besieged Aleppo without being inspected, allowing weapons to get through. The Syrian Air Force would be grounded and it would stop bombing Al-Qaeda in Aleppo for seven days. This would give the US time to convince the so-called moderate rebels to separate themselves from Al-Qaeda. But if they failed, the agreement was anyone that was still working with Al-Qaeda would be open targets. Unsurprisingly, the moderates refused to separate themselves from Al-Qaeda and vowed to continue working with it. Even if they wanted, they couldn't afford to separate themselves from Al-Qaeda because it's mostly Al-Qaeda that holds Aleppo. That said, it's primarily al-Nusra who holds Aleppo. Because the State Department were unable to separate the moderates from Al-Qaeda, they decided the ceasefire proposal was no longer in their favor. They decided to take advantage of the fact that the Syrian Air Force was grounded and attack the Syrian air base. After such a shocking end to the ceasefire, with US airplanes attacking Syrian troops, Russia immediately called for a UN Security Council meeting, demanding an explanation. But a few hours later, a Red Crescent aid convoy was hit on its way to Aleppo, which created a total diversion. The US called its own UN Security Council meeting and accused Russia of being behind the attack on the aid convoy. The media regurgitated US government claims Russia was behind the attack, but official statements from the Syrian Red Crescent themselves never blamed Russia for the attack. The only evidence the likes of Kerry has put forward to blame Russia for the airstrike comes from the eyewitness accounts of the so-called White Helmets. The White Helmets, the credible aid organization that waves Al-Qaeda flags around, carries guns openly and takes part in executions. The same White Helmets that, a few days prior to the aid convoy attack, accused the Syrian Red Crescent aid convoy of being too influenced by the Syrian government. Now, shockingly, it turns out that two days prior, the White Helmets had been running around telling politicians that the aid convoy was going to be attacked and to blame Assad when it does. Now, how did they know about it? Are we supposed to believe that an aid organization has access to signals intelligence? They knew about it because they were the ones behind it. One of the White Helmet witnesses at the scene of the crime recently deleted a Facebook photo of himself holding guns right next to Al-Qaeda. The White Helmets, the Rebels, Al-Qaeda, it's all the same people. The Rebels aren't letting the UN collect the corpses of the drivers. It's the job of the White Helmets to collect bodies, by the way. They're probably afraid of what an autopsy would reveal. You might ask, what would motivate them to attack an aid truck? Well, a few days before the aid convoy was hit, the UN said that the rebels refused to let aid trucks into Aleppo. They even had a protest where kids held up placards saying they won't accept aid unless it goes through rebel-controlled areas. You see, usually, the rebels take control of the aid, they hoard it and then sell it back to people at exorbitant prices, which they use to fund their war. They didn't want it to be distributed directly to the people, and that's what the Red Cross was doing. So who was behind it? The rebels. They had motive to destroy it. Kerry said the White Helmet's eyewitnesses saw Russian planes and helicopters in the sky right before the aid convoy was hit. But US officials themselves admitted there was no radar or signal evidence to support the idea that a helicopter was in the air. An image emerged of part of a missile shell buried in the aid warehouse, which was used by Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat as proof the strike was the work of Russia. However, he was not able to explain why the cardboard boxes around the shell were totally unharmed in the explosion. There is video evidence of a rebel mortar being driven alongside the aid convoy, but Kerry denied seeing it. The defense ministry said that the aid convoy had been accompanied by militants in a pickup truck with a mortar. We've seen no evidence of that. And by the way, that mortar could never have inflicted the damage that has been caused on those trucks. Now guess what? Everything I just said is contradicted by public information. Thanks, Kerry. After being exposed as an ISIS and Al-Qaeda supporter, John Kerry has the audacity 
to suggest both the Syrian and Russian air force be grounded because of the aid convoy attack. So he wants the Syrian air force not to be able to fly over its own airspace and prevent its guest Russia from doing so as well, while the US is violating international law by even being in Syria's airspace. In his own words, he lives in a parallel universe. And, and I sort of felt a little bit like they're sort of in a parallel universe here. And in his own words, the reason he wants to ground the Syrian and Russian air force is because he wants to protect Al-Qaeda, not aid convoys. The UN Security Council has become a joke. There is no ceasefire or any kind of agreement. We are headed to a war trajectory. And perhaps the only hope that this can be stopped lies in the American public who may be able to wake up to the unimaginable fact that their government is aiding Al-Qaeda and ISIS and perhaps stop them from doing so. Waiting for the election results might be too late.